by way of background, I'm a specialist in prehistoric hunter-gatherers, um, and in particular, I do landscape archaeology, and I work with stone tools. I know vanishingly little about plants. I'll say that as a as a starting point for this lecture. Um, and it's actually been a really nice opportunity today to, to, to put this lecture together and actually try and pull out lots of the information that we have found about plants and trees in the Cairngorms, as well as the, the hunter-gatherers that are, are my primary focus. And I hope that some of what we I'm talking about tonight, that you'll have questions about and you'll have perspectives on, because some of it, as far as I understand it, is quite unusual and raises some quite interesting questions about what we know about the relationships between people and plants, and indeed the range of plants that were there. As you can see, there's lots of names um, up here. I've highlighted a few of them um, in, in pale yellow because Rosie Bishop, who I continue collaborating with at the moment, Richard Tipping and Danny Patterson, who were very involved in the first phase of this work, they're the people who've done most of the work on the plants and the environment. So I'm really, I'm kind of summarising lots of their, their detail within this broader project as a whole. So just to, just to give you a sense of where we are, all of the work I'm going to be talking about is in the Marlodge estate in the upper reaches of Glen D in Aberdeenshire. So Braemar is just off to the side over here. The D runs up and follows up into High Glen D with the High Cairngorm and the plateau um, to the north. And we have sites in Glen D itself at the chest of D, just where the D joins the Geldy and on the Geldy as well. Now I'll come back and talk about those in more detail, but I just wanted to give you a sense of where things are. So why are we interested in hunter-gatherers in prehistoric Scotland in mountain? environments and there's a there's a few reasons here some of the are the good academic reasons we know that hunter gatherers colonized mountain environments at the start of the holocene very rapidly across very large parts of europe it's different in different mountain ranges in europe but it's a common feature of the period that people move up quickly into mountain environments as ice retreats and they often live very close to glaciers alongside this Scotland, obviously, is a mountainous landscape, but because mountains are quite tricky places in which to find Mesolithic archaeology, and I'll explain why in a little while, mountains hadn't received very much attention from archaeologists in Scotland. So you can see this recent diagram showing the kind of key sites for the Mesolithic in Scotland has an enormous gap in the middle. And the gap in the middle, obviously, is because when that's where mountains are. So there's a good academic reason to be interested in how did hunter-gatherers live in the Scottish mountains? As ever, there are also personal reasons. I really like mountains. I really like running in mountains. Being able to work in mountains like this is a really good way of bringing things together. I like. So I wrote a paper a few years back called Mesolithic Montology, which reviewed the European Mesolithic evidence, which talked about mountain running and talked about the kind of new nature writing about mountains. I described it as being peak me after I'd finished writing it. And I think probably at that stage I should have given up. I've done everything I can do. But one of the other reasons to be really interested in mountains and their archaeology at the moment is that mountains are changing and dynamic environments. They're changing very, very rapidly because of the interrelationship between climate change and social change. So this means that there's an urgent need to understand the archaeology that's in these landscapes because they are under threat, quite considerable threat. So mountain landscapes are one of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. They talk about indicator 15.42, mountain green cover, and simplifying crudely, this basically says the more trees we have in mountain areas, the better and the healthier they are in, in opposition to, to development. And there's lots of examples of planting schemes in mountains, and increasingly um, lots and lots, and this is obviously a very live topic in Scotland, lots of rewilding movements as well that are transforming the environments of these uplands. Now I'll say this carefully and briefly and perhaps it's something we can discuss later. I hate the phrase rewilding. I think it's a really really problematic phrase overall. We can talk about bringing 
ecosystems to resilience and complexity, but rewilding is really problematic. Rewilding, letting lots of trees grow everywhere, is also quite detrimental to archaeology. And again, you'll see that when we talk about how we find sites. So there's a balance in all of this, and therefore an urgent need to find out more about hunter-gatherers in the Scottish mountains. This has grown and moved on over approximately the last decade, and there's uh, three main projects which I'm talking about here. The first was the Upper Deep Tributaries project from 2013, initiated by National Trust for Scotland in response to their urgent need to understand more about these sites that people had found on their, on their properties. And these sites that have been found on their properties have been found by people volunteering to do footpath maintenance who had realised when they found two or three small pieces of flint, they'd realised that they were important. And we'll come back to why that's a critical part of this work um, as well. But the Upper Dee Tributaries project ran um, in the early 2010s. We've published large parts um, of this work. Anyone who wants, drop me an email and I can send you on details of the papers. We also, from 2001, and this is ongoing, have been excavating a site called Score and Owen in Chester D. This is a collaboration between myself and colleagues in UCD archaeology and colleagues of mine from the University of Stavanger in Norway. And we also have a project from myself and Sam Kelly, a geologist working in Earth Sciences in UCD, called Looking Up that looks at how to manage and preserve these landscapes, how to help the people whose job it is to make decisions about where to plant trees, where trackways should go, where buildings should go. A really, really difficult job that I'm glad I don't have to do. To give you all a frame of reference on this, we're talking here about the, because I'll go into talk about the different aspects of the project now. We're talking about the late glacial period into the Holocene period. So the uh, diagram here, we're starting about 18,000 BC, we're running up through time, and we're dealing with when the this um, wiggly line here is to the left, we're dealing with cold periods, and these are warmer periods. So we have the late glacial maximum running through here. We have the cool, the warming period of the interstadial, the boiling alarod, the cold snap, of the Young Gadrias, what used to be called in these parts the Loch Lomond. I'm not sure whether we're still allowed to call it that or not. And then we move into the Holocene, which we used to call our current geological epoch. We don't quite do that anymore, but I understand there was a cuff up from in nature recently, and the geologists have decided that it still is our current geological epoch. As all of this goes along and changes, the animals that characterize the northwest of Europe change as well. And running through this, we also have the appearance of different types of archaeological evidence for hunting and gathering roots. In the late glacier, we have the Magdalenian, the cold snap, so the warm period of the interstadial, these Hamburger and Federmesser groups, Arensbergian cultures in the cold of the Younger Dryas, and then we move into the Mesolithic. There is some evidence in Scotland for hunter gatherers in the warm period of the interstadial none in the high Cairngorms themselves or the main valleys, but it is only 60 kilometres away along the D that we have evidence of this period. And we have lots of evidence for the Mesolithic period in Scotland. I'm mainly going to be talking about the Mesolithic. Some of the landscape context will also talk about deglaciation and the war that the re-advance of the glaciers in the Younger Dryas as well. So one of the features of the work that I did with my colleague, Sam Kelly, this is Sam um, here, and our research assistant, Cormac, Cormac again in the lab here, was um, as part of our looking at project, we were trying to constrain and understand the timing of the disappearance of ice from the high Kengong mountains, and to see if we could establish any relationship between the timing of that removal of ice and the arrival of people in those areas. So Sam's um, speciality is cosmogenic nucleides, which effectively gives you, so when a rock is first exposed to cosmic radiation, that sets off a series of reactions within the rock, and that creates a series of isotopes. Those isotopes go into processes of decay, and you can therefore date the time that those rocks were first exposed to cosmic radiation by looking at those isotopes. Effectively, what this means is you take a lump hammer and a chisel and you take small samples of 
rock, you take them back to the laboratory, you you basically hassle them for a long time until they fall apart into quartz grains, and then you can dissolve that down into the elements you're looking at. Just to stress, this is done according to international best practice guidelines, and after you've taken your samples, you then have to go in and re-weather the places that you've taken the samples from, so it doesn't show after a very short period um, of time. So Sam samples, he's looking at beryllium and carbon. Um, he's looking at two different isotopes here. Without going too far into the detail of this, this is because beryllium has a very, very long half-life and carbon has a short half-life. So beryllium, if you're looking at rocks that have beryllium, they may actually contain cosmogenic nuclides from a much earlier exposure, which weren't fully removed by processes of erosion. So they have that inheritance of a much older nuclide, where the carbon has a short half-life, so it doesn't. It will only give you that most recent process of glaciation. So this is uh, Loch Arnoain, high up on the Cairngorm Plateau itself, and a series of dates that we've taken from the moraines running at the front of this corrie. So the ice has come down here, pushed into the front of the corrie, and two moraines here. And you can see that the carbon ages about 13 and a half, 14 and a half, 12,000 years ago, but the brilliant ones in black are a lot more variable. And that's because of that problem of inheritance. Up on the um, plateau um, itself in, in Corrie Bui, um, here again, the beryllium ages and the carbon ages, very, very different here. The carbon ages are actually pretty consistent in saying when things were last exposed to the, first exposed to, to cosmic radiation. The beryllium has that problem of radiation. So in geological terms, this is really important because the Cairngorms are a key landscape for understanding the timing and character of deglaciation um, in Britain. And Sam's work here has been able to show that there is this consistent differentiation between some of the beryllium samples and the carbon ones, giving this problem with inheritance overall. But once we drop down into the valleys themselves, this is Glen Derry. Um, here, samples at Derry Dam itself. We don't have those problems with exposure at all, and we're getting quite nice, consistent dates. And these run down, we have dates for the first exposure of rocks to cosmic radiation right at the start of the Holocene, about 11,700 years ago. So right at that point, ice is beginning to back off these landscapes again. Alongside this, what we've also been doing, I'm hoping this is going to work. Um, sorry, let me just see if I can do this. I can't, how do I get a mouse on that screen? Apologies. I just need to play yeah. that video. Ah, all the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. So this is a numerical model of the formation and retreat of ice in the Cairngorm during the last ice age. So this takes modern um, terrain and then basically plays around with changing the temperature and the precipitation to see that formation of ice. And we have key points here. So these are points where we have dates for when the ice retreated from those those locations and you can tweak and alter the model until it actually behaves in the way that you expect and it gives you a dynamic understanding of how ice is behaving in the Cairngorms um, over time and again that's a that's a new contribution to our understanding of that material okay you weren't expecting me to be talking about geology and rocks but I wanted to show you what we've been doing with that um, but to move into thinking about the the Holocene period and the archaeological evidence from this period. The first is to say a few things about overarching things about the landscape. And it'll be no surprise to anybody here that this view of the Cairngorm Mountains as an open, almost treeless landscape is a, a product of a very recent history. This isn't their kind of natural state, if we could even talk about such a thing as a, as a natural state. What we know, um, and there's actually been comparative, although there's a lot of work on the late glacial in the Cairngorms, not so much work has been done on the Holocene. The PhD by Danny Patterson in 2011 remains really, really important here. But what seems to happen is very, very early on in the Holocene, 
river incision stabilizes, slows down. So the rivers become stable very, very quickly in the Holocene period, probably by about nine and a half or 9,000 BC. We then see peat formation start in valley bottoms by about 8,000 BC and on the slopes of the hills, perhaps by 7,000 or 6,500 BC. <laughs> Running through this, we have the appearance of a variety of species of trees, juniper a first, and juniper shrub forms across this landscape. It's then colonized by birch, perhaps by about 8,500 BC or 8,000 BC. And a little bit later, maybe 8,000 or 7,500, pine joins those forests as well. And for a long time following that, this landscape is characterized by mixed pine and birch forests with open areas within. And that changes a bit over time. There are cold periods where the relationship of those different species changes, but that effectively remains dominant forest type in the area, down to maybe three or 4,000 years ago, where those trees go into decline for a complex mixture of climate and humanly driven reasons. And that's what gives rise to this much more, much more open landscape. But through the periods we're dealing with, in terms of earlier prehistory, we're talking about a, a forested landscape. Those forests change, they're not the same over time. The tree line is probably up at about five or 600 metres higher in sheltered areas, but broadly speaking, five or 600 metres. And we know from Danny's work that that forest seems to be characterised by a series of disturbance episodes, and there's evidence of burning in there that seems to suggest that Mesolithic hunter-gatherers were having an influence on the structure of those woodlands, that it's not a, a natural wildwood, if you like. It's something which is being changed by the actions of people. OK, so to think a little bit about the archaeological sites here and the evidence that we have from them. So again, just to give you your bearings here, we have chest of D in here. We have the remarkably difficult to pronounce Kakarman Ruha here, which I often just call Gelgi Burn because that's much easier to say. Um, and then Khan Fiaklebeg, which I won't say very much about in white, and Skoranel in, in red. So those are the sites that we have, all riverine, none of them truly high altitude um, overall, but giving us really, really useful information about how people lived in these mountain landscapes. So we'll start with the site at Chester D. So this is the D running along here. So the D comes down from the higher reaches of Glen D, comes down and basically swings out east, running down into the main valley. And this is the Geldy coming down here. This is Whitebridge. Anyone who knows the area will recognize um, aspects of this. And this is the Chester D waterfalls just up here. Really, really, uh, really beautiful, stunning place. And, and on a sunny, a sunny day, a very nice place to go for to go for a swim. This whole length of the footpath um, along here, as well as scattered other finds around here, includes large amounts of Mesolithic archaeology. It was initially identified in the maintenance of this footpath. This is a high and dry footpath. So in order to construct that, um, people come along and they basically dig down into the peat and into a little bit of the sand and gravel below it throw it up into the middle, they go on the other side and they do that as well. So you get this path on top of the peat running along. But basically the action of cutting the peat and getting down into the mineral soil beneath it was throwing artefacts up onto the top. And the people doing that realised that there was something important here and contacted the National Trust archaeologists. It's really important to stress, I'll say it again explicitly at the end, all of the sites we're looking for here, all of the sites we excavate here, are pretty much only found through the presence of stone tools. These sites, the soils up here are very, very acidic, and the structures that these hunter-gatherers used, as you'll see, were very, very lightweight. So all we can use to find these sites are stone tools. And unfortunately, in many parts of the land, in landscape here, since hunter-gatherers used these places, peat has formed. So we're looking for very, very small stone tools, which are buried by peat. It's not straightforward at all. So we have to rely on places where there's erosion and particularly things like, like footpaths through all of this. So the riverbank um, at Chester D 
Um, here you've got a classic um, pulse on very, very um, uh, fine sands and silts running down here. The exact origin of these soils um, is actually quite hard to, to be certain of at the moment. And we're back there this summer to do more research on this. But lots and lots of archaeological features, spreads of charcoal, stone tools, pits cut down into those areas as well. It's a really, really rich and complicated site. This was the focus of fieldwork by the University of Aberdeen from 2013 to 2016. And they've dug what are really important, comparatively small holes in what's an enormously important, comparatively big site. And it's a site which is spatially very, very extensive and in places very, very well preserved. And at Chest of D, we have fireplaces, we have pits, we have possible evidence for the location of structures. We have an enormous range of stone tools um, as well. Some of that is flint. This is flint in here. All of that flint is coming from the coasts, either um, the coastlines around Inverness or the Aberdeen shore itself. Both of them are effectively 60 or 70 kilometres as the crow flies. So that material has been brought into the mountains um, and then worked in the mountains, a lot of this stuff here, for example, is the waste from making stone tools. So we realise that people must have brought the cores in and then they've started working them there. But there's also quite a lot of rhyolite. This is um, uh, rhyolite is found throughout the Cairngorms. Um, this could be coming quite locally to the site at Chester D. There are outcrops of rhyolite within about ten, within about five kilometres, although they don't seem to be the same type of rock. Again, there could be outcrops of this much closer to the site itself, but they're under peat, so we wouldn't exactly know how to how to track them down. But this mixture of material from a little bit of distance and material, it's very, very local. What's also important about Chest of D is that people kept on using that site for an incredibly long period of time. So simplifying a little bit, there's possible evidence for people using the site at Chester D at about 8,200 BC. That's, I, I still have a little hesitancy about that one, but my colleagues are very happy with it. So we'll go with it for now, 8,200. There's then another phase of activity about 1,000 years later, about 7,000 BC. A few centuries shortly before 6,000 BC, people are back there again. Again, shortly before 5,000 BC. And then right at the end of the Mesolithic, right at the time when farming starts to appear in Scotland, they're there again. So we've got a record of at least 3,000, if not 4,000 years of hunter-gatherers coming back to that location. And what they did in that location wasn't exactly the same each of those times. The landscape wasn't the same. I'll show you some reasons why for that in a moment. The activities that they took there weren't the same over time. They weren't there for 3,000 years all the time. They didn't visit every summer for a 3,000 year period, but they kept on coming back over that time period. I don't know if it's simply a coincidence that it seems to be a kind of thousand year period or periodicity every, every thousand years in all of that, but they seem to keep making that return. It's a big site. It's a diverse stone tool assemblage. It looks like a range of different tasks are being carried out by the hunter-gatherers that live there. It's possible that the River Dee itself is a key reason that they're there, partly through mobility. It's a main axis of communication through the mountains, also possibly as a resource as well. Obviously, the, the salmon runs of the Dee are very famous, but we have absolutely no direct evidence that people there fished, other than the fact that it's a good river for fishing and people were living next to it. A couple of things in terms of the changing environments and the, and the plants um, here. The earlier parts of activity on this site, all of the wood that they're burning is birch. And in the later phases, all of the wood that they're burning is pine. Now, pine is a better wood to burn than birch, so it would seem surprising that that would be a, a choice. Maybe this is reflecting the different woodlands in which people lived, that pine became more available later on. Maybe it's reflecting some different form of social logic of why people were choosing to burn particular things 
or why people were choosing to deposit burnt things in particular places. But it's an odd little, it's an odd little fact. One of the other things that I still find remarkable here is the story of the Chester D waterfalls. If we just go back a couple of slides here, these are the Chester D waterfalls again. There's a lovely pool just a bit down here where the salmon currently rest before they go on the run further up the D. It looks like a classic kind of hunter-gatherer location to exploit those environments. Chester D in just here. But actually, when people first, when hunter-gatherers first went and visited that place and first stayed there, the waterfalls didn't exist. The river ran to the west, just slightly to the west of those rock outlets, and it only evolved and changed channel about 6,500 BC. So during the period of time in which hunter-gatherers were using that site, the landscape changed dramatically from a landscape where there was no substantial waterfall to one that was now present. And it's just a really good reminder that when you're dealing with this period, you have to expect very large amounts of landscape change. You can't assume that what you see now is what was there then. Our site in Geldiburn, um, Kukan and Ruha, um, which I excavated from 2013 to, to 2016, we're about 540 metres above sea level. We're looking to the south here. This is our main trench, smaller one. Here, we're at the slopes just above this very extensive lowland basin that you can see here, which is which is now somewhere which deer congregate quite quite often. The paleo environmental work and the models for the area suggest that at the time that this site was occupied, about 6,200 BC, this was a birch pine woodland, but towards the margins of that woodland in terms of altitude, so maybe an open woodland. It's also possible that rather than being a, 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 a defined river running down here, running down in this direction, that this area was just much more of an extensive wetland at this stage. Um, uh, so a, a valley bottom still with peat forming, but much more extensive wetlands in it um, as well. What we found in, in um, Geldi was uh, really, uh, really quite spectacular. In many ways, it still remains one of the things I'm most proud of having having excavated. We found um, a scatter of stone tools. There are only 131 stone tools from this site in total, 131 artifacts. It's a very, very small um, assemblage. And when I said the chest of D was very diverse in the range of stone tools and the raw materials that are there, Geldiburn is completely different. Geldiburn is only comprised of flint, again, which has to be brought in to that site. Geldiburn is also almost entirely dominated by something we call microliths. These are very small, very distinctively shaped stone tools into little points or little triangles. And you might, if you were making a knife, you might put six or seven of these little points along the side of the knife. Or if you were making an arrow, you might put three or four barbs and a tip into them. So they're, they're what we call composite tools. They're used in large numbers. And I think 40% of our site were broken and fragmentary microliths. And that's one of the highest proportions in Britain that I know of for microliths on a site. So this one is really, really specialised. Of those 130 artefacts that we, that we found, the microliths dominate. We have lots of the debris from making microliths, but we have absolutely no cores. So people must have brought cores with them to strike off blades and turn and change them into microliths. When they finished what they were doing, they took the cores with them and went away. So they went somewhere else with those. A couple of really nice details that come in here. So this is the, the trench itself, and the red is the distribution of artifacts. I'll talk about the colored dots in just a minute. The red is the distribution of artifacts, and the orange is a fireplace we found in the middle. So can you see there's actually a pretty good oval shape being defined around there in those artifacts. It's about 2.5 metres by 3 metres. And we think that that shape is being defined by the covering of some kind of tent. The artifacts are ending up getting knocked up against that and then they drop and fall down to the ground. We have no evidence for the poles of that tent. These are very, very heavy in podsolite soils. You would never find um, that type of evidence. But that nice circle around the fireplace 
we think suggests this is a tent. The floor space there, if you look at ethnographic parallels for the sorts of numbers of people you might get into structures like this, maybe two or three people could fit into one of those. You could have four or five in there, but it would be very cosy. You could have one in there, but you'd have lots of space. We obviously can't tell that, but that kind of number. We also looked microscopically at the edges of the stone tools. Um, and if you look at the edges of the stone tools, you can identify characteristic patterns of damage and wear on them that show what those stone tools were used for. So we were able to identify, for example, here the green are tools which were used for plants. The blue, the light blue, is used on an animal, and the dark blue is an animal hide. And then the pink is stuff that was used for shooting projectile damage. So I think we can say that we have a small tent here, two or three people. There's actually a space in that tent where someone was doing something involved in processing animals. It's less clear with the plants, but we have a sense of the internal arrangements of a tent occupied in the Mesolithic period. Highly specialised, very short term, maybe only a night, maybe only two nights that people were there. And we've been able to pick up that evidence of it, which I think is remarkable. The radiocarbon dates from here put us just after 6200 BC. And that's really interesting because of the what's called the 8200 BP event, a very significant climate deterioration across northern Europe, which some people had speculated actually caused glaciers to reform in the Cairngorms. And it's immediately, it's probably just after it, but it could be contemporary with it, that we have people heading up to this site at Geld. And just to stress, this is the date from Trench 4. We have slightly different dates from Trench 5, maybe a century or two later. So this hillside appears to be somewhere that people came for very, very short term activities. But again, they keep on coming back there. The plants do weird things on this site. This is one of the things it'd be nice to get people's comments on later. So we can see that people were burning. We have the charcoal of alder and pine. Pine is unsurprising, but alder, this could only really just have got into the landscape um, at this time. Very, very um, quite early for it to be found there. One of the things which is really weird is we have evidence for people using the twigs of yew up on this site um, and we had to Richard Tipping was so um, so concerned when I first said the charcoal person says it's you he was like no it can't be you we had three different people look at it they all came back and said it's you and it's twigs you should not be in this part of Scotland at this time and, and it, according to some understanding it should only really be in northern England at this time so why have we got hunter gatherers high up in the mountains of Scotland with twigs of you if it was bigger pieces, you might imagine this was a long bone or something like this. The wonderful rotten bottom bone from the Scottish borders is made out of you, and that dates to the early Neolithic period. But this isn't an artifact. These are these are twigs. So is this for some? Uh, you could be toxic. Is this for its toxic properties in some ways? Is this for burning and letting off its uh, aroma? Is there something that you know about you that I don't know? But it's weird that it's up there. We also have an assemblage of Crowberry and Bearberry seeds as part of this. It's the only Mesolithic site in Britain that has Crowberry and Bearberry seeds. Um, they, they both would have grown uh, uh, quite widely um, around, that, around that area, and they're both quite, quite tasty, although obviously Ray Mears is quite disappointed um, by them in terms of their taste uh, overall. But it's interesting to see that we have evidence of the use of these upland plants. Um, as well. Almost all Mesolithic sites in Britain and Ireland have evidence for the use of hazelnuts. Um, no evidence for the use of hazelnuts on these sites high up in the Cairngorm, presumably because the hazel, the hazel wasn't there. Our most recent excavations are at Scoranoe, high up in Glen Dee, almost 500 metres um, up above sea level. We're on this wonderful flat glacial outwash terrace. So this, the land surface itself, it probably dates to about 15, 16,000 um, years ago. The river has cut down since then by about 10 metres. But what you're left with is this really, really flat surface just before you get into the really high, high mountains. 
We've been um, excavating here, uh, finished the excavation um, last year. What we seem to have is, a, you see this little stream that's running through here. That's where we found the site. Some of my students were up trying to do some survey work. Um, they went to look along the edges of that little well, stream is almost too grandiose a word for it. And they found three flints in the surface. We went back the next year and on that surface found another 13 um, of them, decided this was an important site. In 2019, we were due to go back and um, excavate. And a month before we got there to excavate, we had a phone call from National Trust. Um, so it's called Score and Owen, the, the rock or the hill of the birds. It's a peregrine falcon nesting site. Peregrines are a protected species. There were peregrines nesting on the site and we weren't allowed to go there. Um, so that killed 2019. 2020, something happened in 2020 that made it difficult to go and do archaeological field work. Eventually, we got there in 2021. Uh, we have to go in August and September um, because of the birds, so it can be quite chilly up there, although the photos don't, don't show it. But we have a really nice little site. The little... Um, a little raised area, the bog kind of flattens the topography. The surface of that lake glacial terrace has these little rises on it. And our activity is all over the top of that, of that rise. And you can see it's only quite a small trench that we've excavated here. All of the artifacts we um, identify in three dimensions to the nearest millimeter. And I should stress again that these artifacts are very very small. If you go back to CCR, here is Kakan and Ruha. Again, the mm -hmm. average size of artifacts we found on that site was 8.7 millimeters in maximum dimension. That's insane. It's tiny. And our students go through and they find these by eye. The smallest artifacts they're identifying by eye and us being at a plot like this are only three millimeters long. Just remarkable what they were doing in what are quite difficult conditions. So this is the scatter um, at score and Owen, oh, the different colours are, are two different years. You can see quite a nice edge on this side here, a little bit more diffuse on this side here. And we have this is a particular type of uh, manufacturing byproduct. This is a microburin. This is something you would have made in order to make a microlith, to make one of those distinctive triangular shaped objects. We have four of these, but we don't have any microliths on the site. And again, we don't have any cores on the site. It's all flint. It's all been brought in. Someone has stopped here and they've made stuff, but then they've actually taken away all they brought with them to make it and the stuff that they made. We literally are left with the rubbish that they didn't want on this site. We have to use that to work out what's going on. And you get a series of really interesting differences between Scorano and, and Geldy Burn. Um, itself. They're both very small overall. There's much more cortex, the outer skin of the flint, much more of that on the side of score unknown than there is at Geldy Burn. So that's telling you something about the material that they brought in. And it really looks now, we've done more work um, in the last couple of months, it really looks like people are bringing pebbles of flint, unmodified pebbles of flint to score unknown. Whereas logic in some ways would say you'd actually try and shape them into cores, you'd check that they were good quality down near the sources. Why carry a pebble all that way when you could actually do some work to, to test it? We will see. In terms of uh, wood and plants, the score I know in the, the processing of our samples is ongoing. Um, but we can say some things about trees. And again, the score I know at the moment is a wet, pretty boggy um, place with an awful lot of midges. Um, we've identified three pieces of wood, so two pieces of wood and some charcoal from this site. And they're all different species. We know that there was willow growing there about a thousand years ago. About 2000 BC, the charcoal from the site was dominated by birch. And we have a piece of pine here, and again in situ here, which we think is likely to be mesolithic. So as well as the, the archaeological story we can tell about the hunter gatherers that live there, we're actually beginning to give National Trust some useful information about the changing woodlands that were in place there. To try and just say something, I want, I, I want to say a couple of other things in a minute about one other aspect of the project. But to try and summarise, I said, you know, put a grand title, Deep Time Hunter Gatherers in the Cairngorms. What do we know about what these people were doing in the Cairngorms? Well, the first thing to say is ours is an archaeological perspective. We're, we're limited by the nature 
of archaeological evidence and people tend to fill in the gaps through inferences of different kinds. But all of these sites, we suspect are seasonal. Particularly Skor and Owen and Geldy Burn seem likely to be very, very short term occupations in those sites. Chest of D could have sustained activity for much longer, but it's hard to imagine any of these sites being occupied in the winter. They all seem much more likely to be summer or autumn sites. And indeed, perhaps the, the Crowberry and the Bearberry at Geldy Burn are giving us some hint of the seasonality of use of those. A diverse range of activities at Chest of D, more specialised sites at the other ones. And this is actually where the mountain sites become really important. Because if you're down in the lowlands, you have lots of people repeatedly reworking sites, repeatedly visiting it over time. You've got agriculture taking place, you've got development. Your chance of finding those short term, quite specialised occupations are really, really limited. They just aren't going to survive, whereas we have them up here. So that's really, really important. But what I think I'd stress most of anything about our perspective on these sites is that they're enormously varied. We've dug three of these sites and they're all different. They all tell us different things about how people were using these landscapes. At Chest of D, things are different every time they come back for periods of time. So I can't tell you how people lived in the mountains during the Mesolithic because they did it in different ways and they did different things. And we're still bound by some of these problems about our understandings. All of this, it would be easy to imagine that people go up into the mountains because they want to go hunting. They want to hunt big game. They want to fish. Well, maybe. But all of our sites are on communication routes, massive communication routes through the mountains. Glen D is a long term communication route. The Gel D is as well. So these could simply be stopping points as people are moving through, trying to get somewhere else. The only problem is all of our sites have been found on footpaths because that's the only way we can find them. And to say all of our sites are found on footpaths and then say they're there because of mobility is not the best form of logic for explaining things. So we're stuck on those. A couple of kind of closing points about things that we're doing. Um, I said that what we were trying to find was small. This, this slide kind of helps with that. So this is our site at Gildy Burn. I walked for 20 minutes up the hills on the other side. Didn't walk far. Just to look back over, I got a hell of a fright. I turned around and looked back and two tornadoes flew underneath me going through here. Jesus, they moved. Anyway, this is us zooming in here, here, here. And you just see some really small dots on there. Those are my students diligently digging away over there. This is a core from which blades have been struck. The core is smaller. I realise that post-Brexit, this doesn't transfer very well. This is a one cent piece. It is very small. The core is small and what comes off the core is even smaller. We are trying to find stuff this size and smaller in a landscape that big and covered by peat. And that's really difficult. It's really difficult for us from the university to turn up in these landscapes for a week, two weeks or a month and go and find new sites. You can walk over a site. I know we did it. We walked over a particular footpath day after day for season after season. And it was only on one of those days, two days from the end, that I looked down and went, there's three flints. And then we had to do a quick excavation of that location. We've walked over it hundreds of times before. Only way that people will find this is if people who work and spend time and visit these landscapes know what to look for. So we've been involved in quite a big kind of um, awareness raising um, campaign, working with Digit Scotland to talk about how can I help? What should I do? If I find these sites, who do I report it to? How do I know if it's important? We've been um, reaching out. Um, this is um, the uh, Mountaineering Journal, the uh, Scottish Mountaineering um, magazine. I gave them such hell about early man in the Kangles. Jesus, can't be doing things like that. We've been in the BBC and lots of social media as well, trying to get this idea into people's heads. If they find stuff up there, it could be really, really important. And we had a brilliant uh, podcast uh, last season, Helen um, Wickstead from BBC Outdoors just turned up on site one day and said, can I interview you? And it's the best interview. She spoke to all of the students. Everyone's voice is in it and it gives this brilliant sense of what we're doing. We also um, uh, commissioned some works of art. Um, the 
Uh, some of you here at the start were hearing quite strange uh, kind of waves of music washing over you um, as you wait, as you waited for the talk. That's a composition by Richard Skelton. Um, Richard was a commissioned artist for the Looking Up project. He is a multimedia um, artist. His PhD was a book length poem about the late glacial colonisation of Britain by hunter gatherers. Um, and he'd released albums about the sound of the British landscape at the last glacial maximum. He's brilliant. And he was the perfect person for this project. Um, so he produced a poem. Um, he took our project text and ran a computer algorithm through them, which turned them into, he basically ran a glacier through all of our words and pushed the words up into piles at the edges of the page and then found meanings and connections between those words and turned that into a poem. And he wrote a piece of music where he took Cairngorm stones and inspired by Sam taking apart the rocks in order to find out their cosmic exposure times. Um, Richard manipulated the rocks together, generated pure sound, pure tone, and then manipulated that to make a half hour piece of music that takes you from the late glacial cold through the interstadial warm, the younger dry as cold, and into the warmth of the Holocene. And it's really, really quite, quite stunning. I hope somebody had a chance to hear it, to hear it early. And it was great fun. And so why am I here? Why did I decide to fly over from Dublin and give a talk here? I try not to fly. I try not to do too much travel. And partly it was very nice to have the invitation. Partly I want to hear what you have to say um, about the, the plants and the things we have. But partly you're exactly the sort of people we need to get this message across. That if you're out looking for the rarest form of orchid or whatever it might be, and if you happen to glance down at the footpath and see a small piece of stone, there it is, a small piece of flint, it's about 14 millimetres long. If you happen to look down and see something like that, it could actually be really, really important. Everything I've said to you, over 10 years of work, we've had probably three or 400,000 euros worth of research money. We've employed people through that. We've published four paper, five papers now with two more to come out shortly. We've commissioned art. We've changed the understanding of glaciers. We found the stuff about people in prehistory there. All of that has been possible because the people doing footpath maintenance in the early 2000s, when they saw something unusual, they had the brain to go, that's odd. I'd better tell someone about it. Without that, none of the rest of this happens. Thank you very much indeed for your time.